Welcome to part two of our conversation with Mike Huberty about the spirits of Wisconsin. I mean, just from living in a bunk bed, the only time I ever had a bunk bed was um, in college, in my college dorm. Mm -hmm. And we had a bunk bed in there for two years. And right at that college, if that bunk bed could talk, I'd be in jail. But the... uh, (laughs) The real thing is that I feel like there's, because of the times of life that people live in a bunk bed, Mm -hmm. they just correlate to where emotions are very powerful and um, people are going through a lot of changes. When you think of a lot of times a bunk bed is when people share a room, uh, siblings, you know, for where emotions, they're learning how to control them, they're learning how to handle them. Um, they might be up until the teenage years, you know, like the, the prime poltergeist years, uh, where they could, where their emotions are the most topsy turvy and the energy, um, where, where they spend eight hours a day. I mean, this is obviously, there is no science involved in my uh, theory here whatsoever. Sure. I'm talking straight from the university of my ass here. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, where you're, you know, you have two different people leaving, um, a ton of emotional energy and thoughts and uh, the think about it, if you're when you're a teenager or when you're in junior high think about the highs and lows the high you know it's almost it's almost bipolar because the highs are so great the lows are so bad that you know all those little pieces of um uh you know the memories of your life they're being created the you're doing things for the first time you're experiencing love for the first time or heartbreak for the first time and when you go to sleep uh you know you're you're sitting in one place for seven to eight hours a night and you're leaving it all there um so i mean and you have two people doing it so you have double the trouble yeah and uh and, you know bunk beds are never found in like like there's no, I mean, maybe out in the military or whatever, but there's no some kind, there's no like well-adjusted adults who are like, yes, I'm going to bed in my bunk bed tonight. Good night. I'm going to wake up at five for exercising. Um, it's always, you know, people in states of transition or kids or college kids who, you know, the most tumultuous kind of energies are being left there. Um, speaking of Horicon, though, like actually my sister could probably talk um, about it at length because she went down to Atlanta to pick up all of the slides and the research from the University of Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee professor who had gone and done an investigation on it in the 1980s. Really? Um, And his widow had allowed her to go down and because she's like, I got three or four boxes of a different paranormal research. I don't know what to do with it. And uh, she let my sister have it. Wow. And so that's a lot of the original research um, into what was going on in Horicon. Um, I had gone to a presentation from the like local pastor who had done an investigation. And he, um, he kind of, I, I stayed there for about an hour. Um, it wasn't until he brought up the fact that the kids were playing with Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons, and this is already in 1995, so the satanic panic is over. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he said that Dungeons and Dragons might be at fault for the kids, um, you know, for the ghosts, he's like, you know, I brought it into this whole thing. It wasn't the bunk bed. It was Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a break. Yeah, I'm sure um, a bunch of, you know, a bunch of guys sitting around listening to Rush, rolling dice and painting figurines is what led the devil to try to kick their family out of a house. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I mean, the thing is, it's cool because the paranormal, like, so yes, you had like a, you had a religious guy come in there. Um, you had a professor from the university of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, came in there, the sheriff investigated it. So when you want to talk about uh, something that had a fascinating, uh, like paranormal investigation, like this isn't today. This like Zach Baggins didn't show up and investigate it. You had a you had a professor. You had someone with religious training. You had a police officer, and the local papers were covering it. Not a blog or something. You know, the the, the news, like the, the TV crews were covering. Mm-hmm. It. So you have like real scrutiny on this kind of story, and I think that's probably why the Horicon story sticks with so many people, because. The people that investigated it, the uh, the people that were reporting it, there was a lot of accountability to be had in that kind of situation. 
And so, uh, and, you know, and eventually it makes its way to Robert Stack and Unsolved Mysteries and him walking around in his trench coat or whatever, Elliot Ness <laughs> telling you about the ghost story as a kid. Um, but that's one of the reasons I think that Horcon, uh, the, 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 the tale there, um, ended up being such a, a, a big deal is because, um, it, you know, and obviously the, the bunk bed too, uh, the, the idea of the, the cursed object mm -hmm. that brought that kind of evil to the house. Um, just, uh, it, it is a fascinating tale. And like, like I said, um, I think my sister's is still going through all of those slides and research and everything, uh, to trying to, trying to put a modern perspective on, uh, what they found, uh, 30 some years ago. Uh, in the middle of Wisconsin. Is, does, did the family ever talk about it again? Did they just kind of want to go silent after all of the attention that they got? Do you know whatever happened there? Well, I mean, it's not like, I mean, Christopher Lutz from the Amityville house, I mean, he goes and he shows up at conventions. Sure, yeah. Um, it's n nothing like that. No. I mean, I don't think that anybody's gone really, you know, really gone back. Mm -hmm. The last time I saw someone do like an in-depth discussion about it was like there was a website, um, in like mid two thousands mm -hmm. that went through and like put links to all of the available research at the time, put links to all the original articles. Mm -hmm. Um, but they didn't have any, uh, interviews or anything like modern day interviews. It might be good back to, to go back and see what people remember. It might be good to go back and see if the, one of the kids would come out and be like, no, it was a hoax. Like yeah. we were just, you know, we just wanted to get out of that. We, we, we wanted to get out of that mortgage bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just really curious. I mean, I, it'd be a very interesting one to me personally, just because of what I do and, and this being such an intriguing topic of of talking to one of those people again. I mean, maybe that's some research I should do on my part is find the names and just it would make it would make for a good serial style podcast. You yeah. know, where you take six episodes and go into like, um, you know, what happened in Horicon in yeah. 1986, because there are so because you can go through and find the news reports. You know, if, if you go back in the, the radio archives, if they've saved anything, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, and find those original reports. It'd be fun. I think it's fun when you go back and see like current affair stories mm -hmm. from like 1991. First of all, to see Bill O'Reilly or whatever before he was a blowhard. Sure. But. Um, when you go back and you see all these kind of, uh, like how they, how they were showing it at the time, uh, I think is always a fascinating look to see it's like today. So a lot of times when we're doing haunted history research, we'll go back and we'll find a newspaper from 1885 and the newspaper from 1885 will just flat out tell a ghost story. Mm -hmm. They'll just, like, um, there's one in, uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, let me. Let me let me find this this particular story for you. But it's like this is in the social pages um, in uh, in Waukesha. And it's just like straight up. They go in and I can read it to you here uh, where they just say, oh, yes. And then right around midnight at the Halloween party, um, they decided to conjures conjure a spirit and a grotesque skeleton showed up and everybody ran hiding and it walked around the house for a few minutes until it eventually disappeared and the dancing resumed <laughs> um and you're like you're like what like okay um and then it's there's one you know from a madison newspaper in like 1883 um there's one quote where it goes uh Yes, a 12-foot-long serpent was seen in Lake Mendota. They think it's the same serpent that was reported three days ago that had eaten the dog. Period. <laughs> and you're like, what? Wait, did, a dog? Like, yeah, no problem. It same one. Dog. Yeah, same one from the other day. No big deal. Would at least we narrowed down which serpent it was. You know? <laughs> right. It, you're like, are you, are you insane? Um, you, and so these, these little things... Uh, just you find fascinating when you look at old newspapers. And I, I think that's that's part of um, what makes when, when you when you look at media and how they cover these kind of stories, the most incredulous of stories. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of gives you a feel for people's beliefs at the time, what people are w were willing to accept mm -hmm. uh, re reading levels. Right. It gives you, you know, sometimes you read a newspaper today. 
and it, you know, you read a newspaper from a hundred years ago and you're like, wow, they're, they're written for different levels of intelligence kind of like the, the, like the words used and the way the language is and the descriptions and everything. Um, it, it just gives you a better idea of who the kind of people they were reporting to mm-hmm. at the time. And then that gives you an idea of where we are in the research of these things in, uh, the, how far we've come in belief or how far we've fallen in belief from William James studying these things uh, with the American Society for Psychical Research, uh, you know, in the late 1800s, um, or J.B. Rhine doing it at the Rhine Institute uh, in the 1930s at Duke University, to some dude with an EMF meter and a full spectrum camera doing it for the Travel Channel yeah. uh, today. It, it, it is amazing, and just how it just—it's what's—it's presented, and, and and it's interesting to say, you know, do we believe in this more? Do we believe in it less? It, 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 as a society, because you're right, you would have things like that in the local newspaper where the line before it is, and Mildred J. Weiner's uh, grandparents visited this weekend, and they had a great turkey dinner. The serpent down the road ate the neighbor's dog, and then and then Packers uh, and the Packers play this weekend. You know, it, it's that's. <laughs> That's kind of how it would be worded. I remember, uh, and I'll, I'll transition into this because I have a question for you. I, I'm yeah. thinking of a uh, of a newspaper that that was always worded like this. It was called the Banner Journal out of Black River Falls, Wisconsin. Okay. Um, and it, and up until I've I've been seeing the Banner Journal for probably 20 years, but even in the early 90s, uh, they would still be reporting like, and so and so's cousin came to town. It was very much written as if it was 1920. Um, but it, it's Black River Falls. It's a very small community. Right. Uh, you had mentioned earlier the curse of Black River Falls. And uh, my my grandparents grew up there. I would visit there as a child and would go walking down the Black River and the Sandy Creek and through town and wind around. And I remember walking down by the falls. A lot of fond childhood memories, standing by the big orange moose and getting my picture taken. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I have, a, I have a sweatshirt with that on. <laughs> um, and anybody who loves Wisconsin is going to love this episode because we're making so many local references, which I never do. But hey, um, it, it, so what is the curse of Black River Falls? I've never heard this one. Well, I mean, that basically it's not necessarily a curse, but it, it seems that um, so Black River Falls in the... Uh, late 1800s was going to be a booming community because of the mine there. Mm-hmm. And so um, I can't remember exactly what the, what the mine is. It, there's a book called Wisconsin Death Trip from mm-hmm. 1970. And then they made a, uh, in 1998, um, a British director made a documentary out of it, taking all these photographs of the families from Black River Falls and, and putting it to like narrating the parts of the book. Um, and I think the band Static X even named their first album Wisconsin Death Trip. Uh, even though mm-hmm. I don't even know if they're from Wisconsin. Sure. Anybody in that band from Wisconsin. But the idea of it is that once the mine kind of dried up and this, th- so this boom town, like disease, murder, uh, madness, suicide, uh, alcoholism. It was like the, instead of like a ghost town where you think of the, uh, people in the gold rush came to a place mining for gold. When the gold was gone, they would just go off to the next place. I think what happened to black river falls was when the mine dried up, the people stuck around and the abject poverty that followed kind of turned the town into a hellhole mm-hmm. where it was just a, a sea of uh, depression and alcoholism and domestic abuse, uh, suicide, madness, and all these kind of things, and, and disease and murder. And it just is this like kind of fairly quick descent over a course of a few decades where a bigger town ends up becoming a smaller town because once the, once the mine evaporated, so did people's hope. And, um, it was this idea that maybe black, like, you know, maybe it was a curse. Maybe it was, you know, I mean, I've heard this and I hate the idea of native American curses. That just always makes me make it, makes it sound like that episode of the Brady bunch where they steal the idol. Um, <laughs> So I always, you know, hate that idea. It's like when people say, well, it's over a Native American burial ground, so obviously it's haunted. Um, it kind of just throws this idea of the, you know, the Indians as this other mystical people. Mm-hmm. But um, it's also this idea that, you know, maybe the land was cursed. They exploited it. 
they ruined it and uh, it took its revenge yeah. on them. And I remember talking about this because we used to play at Black River Falls like an all ages club back in the uh, early 2000s a lot. And I remember talking about this once um, with the owner of the club and she's just like, yeah, she's like, I think this place is cursed. And she goes, if I, if I could, if I could escape, I would. <laughs> and just, I mean, straight up, like yeah. if I could, you know, she's like, my family's here. I have, to have responsibilities here. All these things like if, and nobody's even, it's an all ages club. So nobody's drinking, right? This isn't like an end of the night, two o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. Like, I got to tell you, this place is cursed. And I got to get out. It was like a regular conversation. Like, yeah, I mean, I think I've seen some lives be destroyed here and I got to go. Well. And I wish I could. And so I think with, with that town in particular, um, I, I think Wisconsin Death Trips on Netflix, and it's not the feel-good movie of the year, uh, but it is a fascinating look, number one, into like that kind of pioneer um, lifestyle, the minor lifestyle. It's our Wisconsin Badgers. The Badgers were the nickname of miners. Mm-hmm. That's how, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't the, like the, all the Badgers running around making dams or whatever. It was the miners that were called Badgers. And... And so it's a, it's a fascinating look into, um, well, you know, what happens when a boom town goes bust and how quickly, um, you know, humans can start being inhuman to each other. Uh, and some people would say that, that, you know, is that the, like a demonic influence? Is that a curse influence? Is that, uh, or is that just, um, you know, what happens when you, you run out of luck and human, natural human frailty, uh, you know, kindness isn't the first thing uh, that you do when you're worried about where your next meal is coming from. That wraps up part two of our conversation with Mike Huberty about Spirits of Wisconsin. Thank you guys for supporting the program, being gravekeepers, and keeping us on the air. For more on Mike's work, visit his podcast, OthersidePodcast.com, and AmericanGhostWalks.com. Until next time, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening and thanks for the support.